Mage and Exalted with Jazz and Terry. Yeah! Hi, Mage fans. This is Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast. And my guest today is host of the Story Told Podcast, friend of the show, and writer for Exalted, Chaz Kellner. Chaz, how you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? I am pretty great. Today was our office Christmas party, and it was an ugly sweater party. And I successfully avoided the urge to say that people were missing the point with an ugly sweater party because to me it is about the joy of finding the ugly sweater not artificially producing it or buying one like to me an ugly sweater party is when you go into your parents attic and find this hideous thing from 1968 that at the time was pretty cool and now in retrospect we get to mock and not about artificially producing the ugly sweater how do you feel about the ugly sweater wars so I, I agree with you. I think that artificially finding the ugliest sweater on the internet and buying it is cheating. It, it needs to be a sweater that, that has history that someone has given you or that, that has come out of the ether on its own and, and found its way into your closet. And you're like, where the hell did this come from? Exactly. It's like if you found out a blog that posted pictures of signs with lights out that spelled funny things actually was going around with a sniper rifle to create those signs. It's not nearly as funny. So what have you written for or are in the process of writing for Exalted? So I've been involved with two projects so far. Uh, the first is Many Faced Strangers, which is the companion book for the Lunars third edition book that came out of Kickstarter. And for that, I got to write a bunch about uh, animals since Lunars are shapeshifters, which I guess we'll talk about more later this episode. And so animals are important for uh, them to have kind of a, a suite of options. And then I got to write uh, up one of the cool new setting locations in third edition that is lunar focused. And I can't tell you what that is. I like the idea that you're like, I'm writing, writing a location. It's lunar focused. And in the book, it turns out you wrote about the moon or something like that. <laughs> like, it, was, it was kind of on the nose for that. We are here to talk about Exalted. What is Exalted as an RPG? I know it as a game that White Wolf produced after the old world of darkness was kind of drawing down. And there were advertisements that were like, before the world of darkness, there was something else. And then it was people like miles above a city kicking each other at high speed. So w what is Exalted. So Exalted is an anime-inspired, non-Western uh, drawn fantasy epic where you play uh, mortals elevated to godly power in an ancient world that has not yet been wrapped around a globe, so the world is flat, and you kind of live out the consequences of having such great power. When you say the power of a god, can you give me an example? Is it what is it something where you can point at someone and just kind of smite them? Or what are kind of the upper ends and lower ends of what this godly power is? Sure. So uh, I guess when I when I say godly power, um, a better way to think about it, and, and this, this comes from one of my players, and he said this was the moment where Exalted really clicked for him, is that in Exalted, you are playing wuxia heroes in a martial arts setting where you as the exalted are the guys who have the wires attached and and that's a great a great kind of starting level for where you are with exalted so uh, you've got mystic martial arts you've got uh sorcery uh, you've got tremendous social influence abilities so you're you're a mortal but but can use your magic to push yourself to be better at, at practically everything that you do so crouching tiger hidden rpg uh yeah to a certain degree where does it depart, I guess, from that stereotype? So as you get a, a little bit more powerful, you definitely get more overtly magical powers, regardless of what type of exalted you are. So it, it, for example, as one of the solar exalted, your kind of basic melee charm, uh, excellent strike, lets you sword, sword gooder. Whereas a kind of a mid-tier charm blazing solar bolt lets you shoot beams of light out of your sword, Hyrule style, uh, as if you are Link wielding the Master Sword with full hearts. That's impressive. And I was thumbing through the Exalted Core rulebook for third edition, which I got because I have no self-control and I found it cheap on eBay. And I saw that one of the charms apparently allowed you to turn an intimacy into an arrow and then shoot someone with it, which suggests to me that you could kill someone with a bow powered by the fact that you were picked last in kickball in high school. Yes, some of the powers do get very esoteric. 
Well, we're talking about Mage, which I think is best summarized by the little chart that says what attacking the darkness means in each game. And in Mage, it's roll for initiative. Mage is a weird world. The darkness will probably fight back. So we, you are these very powerful characters. Uh, do you start powerful or do you start as a mortal? Is there a mortal aspect to this game and people turn into exalts? What does that exalt process kind of look like? So yes, you start as a, a mortal, but you may not play out this part of the game. Um, I have done that, uh, kind of using mortal characters as, as a prelude. But the core assumption is that as a starting character, you are already one of the chosen, one of the exalted. And so you have a, a pretty powerful s starting point. You are, you are already in a position where absent gods or other exalted or sorcerers, uh, very little is likely to stand in your way without significant uh, effort on their part. So if mortals are level one, it's not like you're level two, you're like level five. Yeah, I think there was a great way of explaining that. I think this was in the second edition core book, and it said something like, there are those who excel beyond their peers, there are, and then there are those who excel beyond all others, and then there are the exalted. Mm. I saw immediately how powerful they are, because as an old World of Darkness player, I am used to 753 as your primary, secondary, and tertiary for attributes. And then in Exalted, you get 864. And I'm like, this is broken. That's insane. That's 50. Yeah. So <laughs> I was screaming and no one else in the house understood. Well, Lunars get 975. 975. That's ridiculous. I know. But it gives you an idea of even mechanically, there is a set apart just to kind of reinforce this. So we've made mention to ability and attribute dots. Does it use the storyteller system or something else kind of to power it? It is definitely a storyteller derived system. It came out of the era when they were kind of pushing storyteller to the limits. So it takes some of the technology developed in Trinity and in Aberrant and like, yep, we've got some, some super powerful stuff, but we're not going to go that automatic successes route. Let's try something different. And that's kind of when the exalted system came out in the evolution of storyteller. It does have mostly fixed target numbers. So you don't have bizarre probability curves that you get by changing target numbers. Hmm. And that has stayed true, uh, except for the Sidereals, who can change the target numbers, because Woo. that's what they do. And target number in this case is the number the die needs to show to indicate to the game that you have succeeded. Yes, uh, that would be called difficulty in, in Mage Parlance, I believe, mm -hmm. since that, that changes. But difficulty in Exalted refers to something else, uh, which is how many successes you need for the challenge to be overcome. I remember the first time I read a system that had fixed target values for the die, and it's like difficulty three. I'm like, wow, you're going to wipe the floor with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have seven dice to deal with. What are the odds of me failing? And then later on, I'm like... Oh, this is much more difficult. <laughs> so continuing our tour of creation, you said it hasn't wrapped around a ball. So I'm picturing this big like pizza box or dinner plate world. What does it look like? Yeah, so creation is a flat world stretched outwards by the elemental poles, which represent the five elements. So in... Uh, it's kind of anchored in the center by the elemental pole of Earth, which is this massive mountain uh, in the center of the world that kind of holds up the rest of the world. In the north, you have the elemental pole of air. In the east, you have the pole of wood. In the south, fire. And in the west, water. And each of those elements kind of predominates over that direction of creation uh, more and more as you reach the edges of creation. So, for example, in the south, you have deserts and then volcanoes and then like firestorms raging off the edge of the world. Uh, because all around the edge of the world is a sea of chaos called the wild that is in a constant state of flux, really shaped only by the presence of creation and the solidity of creation and the anchoring power of the elemental poles. Interesting. That super sounds like the deep umbra or the deep universe in mage where there's this area of unformed chaos that monsters dwell in that maybe a very strong willed person could possibly manipulate. Is it kind of the same there? Uh, yes. Although it's, it's more than just strong will that would be required to manipulate it in exalted. Are there planes? Like, is there an underworld or is there anything analogous to the rest of the Umbra in the game? 
Well, I can't speak to the Umbra very well, but but oh boy, are there planes. There are several other realms in the setting of Exalted. You mentioned the Underworld, so we'll start, we'll start there. The Underworld is a reflection of creation that kind of has accumulated the detritus of creation that has died, but it was not meant to exist. The Underworld uh, was created when the first of the Primordials was slain. These are, are beings who were formed out of chaos and created the stable universe. Okay. And so when the first one of them was killed, their remnant sunk below creation and the underworld was created as, as an echo or reflection. And so that's where the underworld comes from. And that's that's inhabited by ghosts. It's very influenced by the underworld of the Wraith setting. And there, there has been talk that in Third Edition Exalted, they're going to take another step away um, from the world of darkness roots but dark, a kind of a dark reflection ha- inhabited by ghosts uh, who get soul forged, uh, ruled over by death lords. There's a, there's a lot of familiar things for anyone who's familiar with Ray. And, and the idea of a bureaucratic afterlife is not exactly a new thing. So even if one were to never see Wraith, you could come up with a afterlife ruled by some sort of iron hegemony or celestial bureaucracy and kind of come to the same place. Are there any other god corpses littering creation or I guess creation with a lowercase c in this case? There's two types of, of god corpses, really. Uh, there was another type which no longer exists, but it's great <laughs> fodder for stories. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in the underworld, like I said, when the primordials were slain, or some of their defining souls were slain, because each primordial was a being with multiple souls, those souls uh, were cast into the underworld and became the neverborn that are tied to oblivion and that want to suck all of creation down into the underworld and end all life. So their dominion will be complete once again. In addition to primordials being slain, when their defining souls were slain, their remaining souls were changed because each soul of a primordial is an aspect of its being. So when that aspect was slain, it changed into something else. And those are the Yozis, uh, who are these kind of demonic uh, entities that are, are made up of multiple demon souls that are trapped in Malfis, which is the, the demon realm, but also the inside out corpse of the greatest of the primordials, also called Malfis, that has become the demon city. Surrounded by the uh, demon or by the Yozi form of another one whose name I can't recall at the moment, but is the endless desert that surrounds the demon city, except that when you summon a demon, they can travel three days across the desert and reach creation. So there's a lot of a lot of kind of metaphysical weirdness going on there. And then you have the hierarchy of souls of each of these uh, Yozis that exists in the demon realm as both parts of a composite being and individual entities in the realm. But this sounds like something where if I'm a mage player and I want to come up with a backstory on why demons exist, it sounds perfectly reasonable that I could take the pure ones from mage and say the pure ones were around and some of them died and this is what happened to the bits of them. And so that seems ripe for pickings cosmologically. Yeah, I think I think Malfi's for sure could fit into a modern world of darkness setting, finding some way for it to drift closer or to be drawn in. So are there any other realms? There are. So we talked about the wild stretching out beyond creation, this realm of chaos. Uh, And but before the primordials who rose out of the wild built creation, they built kind of a bubble domain, Yushan or heaven, which is actually the second heaven because there's another heaven, Zenmu, that is sealed somewhere else. But the second heaven is where the gods reside in the age of sorrows, if exalted. And the gods are this vast bureaucracy with multiple departments, including the bureaus of fate, who are served by one of the types of exalted, the sidereals who we mentioned before. And Yushan is a copy of the geography of the central island of creation, which is an island like slightly larger than Russia, to give you some sense of scale for this island. And uh, in Yushan, it's entirely covered with with a city because the, the gods and the bureaucracy have just filled it up. That is Yushan, and it is surrounded by a wall, and beyond that wall is nothing. And through that wall are gates that are portals into creation, each guarded by jade lions who zealously guard the gates of heaven and are entirely incorruptible. 
is this a thing that mortals can go to or exalted can go to? Because when you describe the city of the gods, if it is a place you can go to, that super sounds like an interesting alternative to the spires in Mage, where you can uh, talk to various embodiments of various ideas if you want to try something different. Yeah, uh, you you very much can travel there. Uh, mortals usually don't uh, because it's hard to get there without either divine power or kind of knowing secret ways to to get there. Those portals that I mentioned beforehand. Uh, but there is a mortal population that that dwells in heaven. There are exalted who either visit or live in heaven. Those are the sidereals uh, because they serve the bureaus of destiny that are overseen by kind of the by the incarna who are the embodiments of celestial bodies. And yeah, so you can definitely get to Yushan uh, as a mortal or as an exalt. Oh, interesting. So if I'm playing mage and the high umbra, I want to try a change of things and I want to change the weather in an area or something like that, or find out a secret or adjust someone's fate or destiny, I could replace the high umbra with Yushan. My characters go to this giant celestial city and now they have to navigate this dizzying bureaucracy maybe to find the particular sub-god in charge of the souls of accountants that were born in New Jersey between October 1973 and November 1974 and then bribe that person to change their fate. Yeah, certainly possible. So this is a fascinating list of god bodies so, so far. Are there any more? So uh, one of the others is Arakthania, which is the realm created by one of the primordials who sided with the gods uh, when the gods rebelled against their creators to rid creation of their influence. Okay. And Arakthania in er earlier editions was responsible for inventing the process of, of uh, exaltation okay. and ended up siding with the gods. And so sometime after the Divine Rebellion was successful and uh, the first deliberative, the government of the Exalted, was established in creation, Arakthan uh, left creation and created a new pocket dimension, which is Arakthania, which has a different set of five elements and its own mortal population and its own Exalted, who are the alchemical Exalted. And alchemicals are kind of cool because while all Exalted have charms, Alchemical charms are, thing, are, are physical things that they actually install in their bodies, kind of robot style. So you are a... God cyborg? A god cyborg champion, yes. And <laughs> as, your, as your power grows, uh, you may expand beyond your mortal size to be like a mecha, uh, but that also has a self that can step out of that mecha. And then also even beyond that, expand out into a city. So the cities of Arakthania are the elder exalted of the alchemicals. Oh, interesting. This sounds like the RPG version of like Spore or something like that, where you physically <laughs> grow larger and more complicated over time. And, and, and you mentioned alchemicals, and it's called Autochthonia, which we also have in Mage. Is there a machine or machinery tie-in to it? Is it like steampunk or anything like that? Or what, what is the aesthetic of Autochthonia? Oh, yeah. So the whole the whole world is uh, like mechanical uh, setup. So everything is like mechanical ecosystems. So it's both living and machine. There's an imbalance. I, mean, I remember it's been a while since I've read the Alchemicals uh, book or the Compass of Celestial Directions, Autochthonia, where they described it in detail. But if I recall correctly, there's an imbalance in the elements and Autochthon himself is missing. And so you have this uh, pocket world starting to run haywire and run out of resources. And so uh, one of the big plots was the alchemicals trying to sneak into creation and steal stuff uh, <laughs> to, keep, to keep their world alive. And just for listeners, if you're curious, I bought a bunch of the Exalted supplements before having ever read the core rule book. I picked up Graceful Wicked Masks on the recommendation of Victor Kinzer from Walking Away from Arcadia because the Raksha, the antagonists, the the wild creatures that inhabit the wild seemed interesting to me. So I grabbed that, thumbed through it, grabbed a bunch of ideas and used it in my chronicle without any difficulties and without the core rule book. It takes a little bit, but if you're holding the book in one hand and you have the wiki in the other, you can get through a second or third edition exalted book and many of the first ones without too much difficulty. So if any of these ideas or any of these references sound particularly interesting and you're looking for a link, go to our show notes. We'll have the drive through RPG link to everything there. Buy it. We get a small cut and you've got something super imaginative to add to your setting. So we were touring creation. We talked about the alchemicals. 
So we've gotten to talk about the locations. What about the denizens? So we've talked about exalts. Are there different types? Like you made mention to siderials, which I know have a tie to mage apparently, and loners. What are the exalts and kind of where do they get their power from? Originally, there were five types of exalted. Now that has expanded. Uh, We're talking about 10 types of exalted uh, regularly. But the basic idea of exaltation is that a a god or other immensely powerful being sacrifices a portion of its power to ignite uh, the spark of heroism within a mortal who then gets some of that godly power. And the original idea was that the gods were, were created to be essentially servitors to the primordials, and so they, they didn't have free will, but mortals were created with free will, and so by the gods granting them power, that was how they could stand against the primordials. Uh, so each type of exalted is colored by the divinity that has granted them power. What it sounds like, you have the primordials who have always been there. They create the gods to run creation. The gods create the exalts to try and get through this loophole. The exalts help kill the primordials or banish them, maybe with the exception of whatever the primordial that is creation. The exalts are set up kind of in charge. And then you mentioned, I think, an exalt curse. So I imagine something goes sideways at some point in there. And like all things, we can't have nice things for too long. And then creation kind of goes sideways. Is that a grand timeline that's somewhat accurate or? Yeah, the death curses of the primordials uh, are called the great curse uh, that, uh, that afflicts all of the exalted who are kind of doomed to madness or hubris and uh, overreaction. And so part of this is to get the, the pathos of playing Achilles brooding in his tent while the the army around him is is losing to the Trojans uh, or or others uh, or Hercules' madness and killing his own family, that that kind of pathos that that comes with um, ancient heroes. And does that work like a a hunger mechanic in Vampire or even Paradox in Mage, that you have this thing that accumulates and if you get too much of it, it may snap and bad things happen? Yes, that's exactly how it works. It's actually called Limit Break, uh, which is counterintuitive to any of any of us who have played the Final Fantasy games. And when I flipped through the original Exalted book, I said, oh, Limit Break, that sounds awesome. And when I got the, home, got the book home, I'm like, oh, that is not what that means. But this is really cool. Paradox Realm sounds like a great place to visit. It's like one of those <laughs> things where like waterboarding at Guantanamo Bay sounds awesome as long as you know what none of those words mean. Um, <laughs> Yep. So let's do a rapid tour of the exalt types. And our goal is, what are they? What's their special power? What is their role in creation, if that's a thing? Like when I think of like werewolves, it's like the werewolves are guys warriors and the grawl, the werebears are guys healers. I don't know if there's an analog of that. But uh, what are they? What are their special powers? What's kind of their motif and who empowers them? So what are, when I when I hear exalts, what, does that refer to a specific type in general? Like wh- what do I get with the core rule book? So the core rule book ha- has the solar exalted and the, the kind of the core play experience is around the solar exalted who are the chosen of the unconquered sun, the mightiest of the gods, and they are embodiments of excellence. And so they are the best at whatever it is that they put themselves to. And they were created to lead the exalted host and to rule over creation once the gods retreated to heaven. Now, as I mentioned, the great curse before, uh, the solars went mad and kind of abused creation. And so the other exalted eventually rose up and overthrew them and imprisoned their souls. So there were no solar exalted appearing for about 1500 years. And just recently in setting, they have started to reappear and started to face off against the challenges of the age of sorrows. And so you have a religion that teaches that these solar exalted are demons and need to be hunted before they gain too much power. And so you have this being an epic hero, but also being hunted and outcast from most societies as as the core play experience. So they are awesome at everything. They're they're the standard. You get to roll 37 dice, which is what I associate with Exalted. And I guess that covers everything. You have the fight gooders, the argue gooders, the spy gooders, the assassinate gooders. Do you have like the art and the poetry gooders too? It does it cover everything? Yes, it does. So there, there are there are five casts, and I don't know how, how deep you want to get into this. Nah, but we, okay. But there's a type that covers most of the main things. You've got you can you can more or less make a full party out of exalts using whatever RPG like standard 
stereotypes or tropes that you'd want to. You had mentioned that there's a religion. What, I mean, if the gods exist, what does religion look like in Exalted? So uh, there, this is one of the areas that uh, third edition is really starting to explore more. But in the past of Exalted, uh, religion kind of got broken down into three categories. You had uh, the central religion, uh, which is kind of kept by the dragon blooded of the Immaculate Order, which saying that gods, gods have their place, which is in heaven. Mortals have their place, which is to serve the Exalted. And the Exalted, being the dragon blooded in this case, have the, their place to defend creation and rule over the mortals and to keep gods in their place in heaven. So it also preaches some version of reincarnation, where if you are true to your station, you will reincarnate in a higher position. The pinnacle, of course, being exalted, and that's why they have the freedom to do what they want, and the and you must serve them. Okay, so that that sounds like something that was set up by them for their benefit. What empowers the dragon blooded? So the dragon blooded are empowered by the elements, and rather than being individually chosen by the gods, they have elemental power in their bloodline. And so you get family lines of the of the dragon blooded. I think that's really cool because it ties them closer to the societies of creation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the realm, which is the empire of the dragon blooded at the cent on that central island of the world uh, that kind of rules the peripheral lands around it and stretches out as far as it can, sucking in tribute, slaves, and wealth to the central isle. And the core setting of Exalted has the Empress having disappeared five years ago. And so the dragon-blooded houses are kind of at each other's throats. If two solar exalts have a baby, do they have a solar exalt? Is that a thing that can happen? Nope. They are not disqualified from becoming a solar exalted, but uh, you become a solar exalted by attracting the attention of the unconquered sun in a moment of heroism. And the sun being like, yeah, you. You're awesome and heroic. But just because my dad was a hero, the soul, the, the unconquered son isn't like, oh, yeah, you totally got this in the bag. Whereas with the dragon blooded, two dragon blooded have a baby. There's a pretty good chance that they have a, a little dragon blooded. Or is it like a one in ten, a one in a thousand thing? It's very complicated and intentionally left uh, undefined. Got it. To the point where even in world, the dragon blooded don't have a complete theory of how it works. And there's a bunch of superstition around it. Uh, there is like a, a mystic quest they can go on to guarantee that their next child will exalt. But otherwise, it's kind of up in the air. It's not like one of those things where if a wood type exalt wants to have a wood type baby, they don't have to like go bang a tree or anything like that. So that's, no. that's good. Okay. So that covers those two. You had mentioned uh, lunars. What are they? So the Lunar Exalted are the Chosen of the Moon, and they are shapeshifters, tricksters, shamans. Werewolves, got it. Yeah, well, <laughs> not just werewolves, but all of the pharaoh all at once, because they can each one can hunt uh, creatures in the world and steal their forms, whether animals or people. Uh, so they shapeshift beyond just being like one form. They can, can steal a variety of shapes, uh, and they are... Well, waging a war of revenge against the dragon blooded uh, oh. because the dragon blooded were the ones who rose up against the solar exalted and and killed them in the past and okay. the lunars escaped the initial killings and have waged a war of revenge ever since essentially okay so is that like a, a guerrilla action or something like that or do you see a lunar leading an army uh, you get both uh, in that the the war takes different shapes in different places at different times. Uh, creation is a huge world, several times that of our own world if it were to be stretched out onto a plate. And so you get very different conditions depending on where the war is waged. So you may have a, a war of, of spies and assassins in the realm itself with the Lunars killing key dragon-blooded ministers. Uh, or out in the periphery beyond the reach of the realm, you may have whole kingdoms that have been taught to revere the Lunars as gods and that the dragon-blooded are the enemy. So this is a not a urban fantasy setting. So when you say can take on the forms of other things, can they take on the form of a dragon or a rock or a cockatrice? Do mythical entities like that exist in this setting or weird creatures? And can they turn into those two? 
Uh, yes, there are mystical creatures. No, the Lunars cannot shapeshift into them. They are limited to animals and mortals. However, there are animals that are like, you can find a dinosaur and turn into a dinosaur if that's what you want as a Lunar. <laughs> Lunars do also have charms that let them mix their shapes so they can become uh, what's called chimera, where instead of having a single spirit form, they have a mixed spirit form that, that adopts a variety of, of traits from different animals. But they can only hunt and, and steal the forms of real animals. And I, I, I put real in quotation marks because there are some fantastical beasts that count as animals, but not ones with supernatural powers. Got it. But you may run into like a glyptodon or an oronk or some sort of crazy giant megafish. It's just not a magically powered super giant megafish. Exactly. Are there any limits to that? Can it be like form of naked mole rat? Like how <laughs> how lame does this get? Well, uh, in my game that I was running last night, I had a lunar who was turning into a brown headed cowbird to be uh, basically seen as non-threatening and to be able to, to fly in somewhere without being noticed. It, it really can be any animal form, just you're probably going to find forms that have some purpose to them. Okay. So we've covered the sun, we've covered the moon, we've covered kind of the earth. What other things can empower? Like you made mention of there being an underworld. Are there underworld exalted or are there demon exalts? Yes and yes. And yes again. Okay. <laughs> The Underworld Exalted in 1st Edition were the Abyssal Exalted. And rather than being chosen by the beings of the Underworld, they are solar exalted souls that have been stolen and corrupted by the Neverborn, tainted with oblivion, uh, to be dark reflections of what they once were. And so they are kind of the ghostly champions of the Underworld, chosen at a, at a moment of death, that is kind of a, a second bargain at life for the Abyssals. Okay, so they sound like wraiths or geists, but not necessarily Nefandi. Yeah, I mean, it, it, they can... They, they can... work for death, but not nece that isn't necessarily the same as evil? Well, yes and no. I mean, certainly they can veer towards we're just we're just champions of oblivion and we want to destroy everything. That is okay. that is one end, but they don't have to be that. There's okay. some range. They serve the Death Lords, who I mentioned, who are uh, I actually haven't mentioned, but are the ghosts of ancient solars who again want revenge against the world and were empowered by the, the Neverborn as well, and who now kind of oversee the long war against creation. And those are just the dark reflection of solars. The abyssals? Yes, yes. pardon me. There were three yeses in there. Uh, one of the, the second yeses, uh, the the demons, the the Yozi, those those banished outsides in a giant city surrounded by a desert. Do they have their own exalt type? Yes, they do. Uh, but also like the abyssals, uh, those are based on stolen stolen solar souls. Okay. So uh, I told you that that the dragon blood had rose up and defeated the solars and captured their souls so they wouldn't appear. The Yozis and the Neverborn plotted and found a way to steal those souls to make their own exalted. Just as the Abyssals are kind of the underworld corrupted solar exalted, the infernal exalted are the, or the green sun princes, are the exalted of Malfis, where each one is fused with a demon that gives it demonic power in addition to being champions, like uh, uh, champions and masters of, of whatever they put themselves to. And are demons in this setting evil as, as defined by the denizens of creation? Not necessarily. Demons are alien for sure and hyper-focused on whatever their thing is. Uh, many are destructive. The Yozis and the third circle demons, their defining souls, are usually bent on the destruction of creation, but second circle and first circle demons, kind of the lesser echoes, are more focused on their own agendas at times. So you may have things like, one of the types of demons are these giant bugs uh, that eat books. They can be, they can appear in libraries that have been neglected, uh, where bookworms begin to eat the books. And any book that they have eaten they can spin silk with the content of that book on it. So they can be these repositories of knowledge. And their drive is to eat books to increase their store of knowledge, which they can't access except by spinning it out into sheets of silk. So that's one of the example types of demons. 
but and there probably isn't like a demon that promotes the arts or maybe musical theater in middle schools, probably. Uh, there are certainly demons that have associations with music uh, and with the arts, but there's usually some twist to them. Like we're making out of a, an, an organ out of infants or something like that to, to make it appropriate for, for demons and such. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say it, 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 that that obviously baby killing evil. But... <laughs> <laughs> I was more thinking it was more of like sweatshop labor, like it wasn't made of. But oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the ticket, Terry. So far, you also mentioned the alchemicals, which are uh, cyborg robots that have their abilities represented as modules and so on that can eventually grow into massive size. And I assume there's a Pacific Rim tie-in there, or maybe they were introduced so kids could get like BattleBot versions of them. I'm super looking forward to seeing the action figures of those should they ever come out. Um, Are there any other types that we haven't talked about yet? You asked if there were Exalted of the Underworld, and in 3rd edition they introduced a second Exalted of the Underworld type in the form of the Liminal Exalted, because the Liminal Exalted are what happens when someone tries to bring back the dead, because in the first two editions of Exalted that was one of the very few things that magic could never do. Hmm. Magic could never truly bring back the dead. You could summon a ghost and bind it to a servitor, so you could get this kind of echo of the being, but they weren't truly alive. But the liminals are what happens when those rules are broken. And they are touched by an entity called the Dark Mother that is also still very secretive, uh, but resides in the underworld. And the liminal exalted are dead, and they can replace their body parts to be better at things as as, uh, part of their charm set. And they, they kind of have to harvest parts as they go if they suffer injuries. It's kind of unclear exactly what the play experience of the of the liminal insulted will be like, but they're somewhat monstrous in the way that they are touched by death. I think a Frankenstein's monster to an abyssal's vampire. I was about to say it sounds like Frankenzalted. You've mentioned that they were other celestial bodies. What are they in the setting, and do they have an exalt? Yes. So in addition to the sun and the moon. The five planets, which are kind of the five classical planets of the Greek era, all have maidens who oversee the bureaus of destiny. Uh, Their chosen are the Sidereal Exalted. And when I said the dragon-blooded rose up and defeated the solar exalted in the ancient past, I was lying. It was really the Sidereals. But they have broken reality, so reality doesn't remember them. And uh, they have a really interesting place in the creation setting They work for the bureaus of destiny, and they are kind of heaven's secret service in that they are the troubleshooters who go and deal with problems in creation that the gods can't deal with directly, or that are tangling the threads of destiny overseen by the maidens. So when you say the threads of destiny, I get the sense that that may be literal uh, yes, there, there is a, a, an object, a, an artifact of divine power called the Loom of Fate, when there are basically celestial spiders made out of star metal that uh, weave destiny as a physical loom, and that's overseen by the gods of the bureaus of destiny, who kind of tell the spiders what to do, and then the spiders weave things together because they're the only ones who can understand the full complexity of it. But there are things that can tangle destiny. Tremendous power, sorcery, things from the underworld, invasions from the wild. All these things can tangle the threads of destiny. And so it's Sidereal's job to go and troubleshoot that. But for instance, uh, two mortal kingdoms declaring war on each other and using, I almost said sleeper, but mortal armies to wage war. That's that's all already in there. Yes. Okay, interesting. So what are these entities that, that spin this thing called? I believe they're called pattern spiders. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, mock, knock that off your uh, Mage Exalted crossover bingo card. Okay. They, they were they were developed by uh, Arachthan to to work the Loom of Fate. Uh, originally, it was the the five maidens: uh, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, who did the weaving. But Arachthan built the pattern spiders to serve them and, and take care of it, so that they could go off and do other things since that's one of the reasons the gods had the Divine Rebellion, was so that they could do other things instead of just serve the Primordials. Interesting. So these secret agents, it seems like all the other groups tied up, uh, tie off to something in in World of Darkness that succeeded possibly the Age of Sorrows. You made mention to being agents of destiny. What what else are the powers of these sidereals? 
Well, they have the power to influence astrology. So destiny, each of the maidens oversees five constellations, and then each of those constellations have associations. And so the Sidereals can petition for those constellations to aid or hinder mortals within creation. They can also craft identities uh, from those constellations. Uh, but one of those constellations, the mask, was damaged. And this was done to give Sidereals arcane fate, which uh, means that creation can't remember them. And uh, in their kind of their natural state without adopting a persona from one of the other constellations, people that they meet won't remember them. Does that include other exalts or is that just a thing that affects mortals? Yes and no. It does affect other exalts, but less so than it does mortals. So it, it's not absolute. In its current form, it's said to be a narrative. So if you're a sidereal interacting with mortals, they will probably forget who you are if they haven't seen you for a day or so. Uh, but with the exalted, they're more likely to remember you, even if the details are fuzzy. So that's, that's a pretty big spread. Are we missing any exalt types? Yes. Yes, we are. Uh, because <laughs> there are so many... <laughs> Third edition also introduced the exigents, who are the exalted of everybody else. Uh, because while not all of the gods have the power on their own to create exalted, the unconquered sun created a, a, a power called the exigents that other gods could use to create their own chosen. And so this is one of the new types introduced in third edition that the next one's up in terms of who's going to get a splat book. And it really opens up the possibility to have a divine champion of all kinds of other gods. So one of the example characters is the, the champion of a, of a harvest god. And this is the, the tiny harvest god of a, of a little agricultural town. And this god has barely enough power to, to power the exigence. But he does so because his town is under threat and going to be destroyed. And so he sacrifices himself and his own power to choose one of the women in the town to be his champion, the harvest maiden, to protect the town. Whereas there are city father gods. These are gods that, that are the patrons of cities across creation. And they, by and large, exalt champions that are called architects. And this is a whole broad ca category of exigents who just receive a portion of their divine patrons' might and are champions of their cities. There are a few more types of exalted coming. So little has been produced about them that I don't think it's, it's worth getting into them in depth since we have spent so much time talking about different types of exalted. Uh, I think that's a good place to leave it. Yeah. So we, we've discussed the exalt types, and I think some of the, the major opportunities for that are pretty straightforward. Within the world of darkness, we have a fair number of powerful umbral entities, and it would make sense that rather than sending a spirit to do work in the mortal realm, which could be very painful to them or very problematic, instead, a mortal worshiper could be empowered, and I could look to the exigent type as a thing for that. If I were looking for zombie rules or something that's caught between the living and the dead— I grab the uh, the Liminals book. If I want to have cyborgs that aren't just another set of cyborgs, if I want to have magic cyborgs, I grab the alchemicals, uh, so on and so forth. I feel a particular tie to these uh, sidereal folk who seem pretty BA. And I guess eventually for players that are interested, we'll get more third edition books for pretty well all of these. Uh, that's the plan. Oh, awesome. So we've identified a whole bunch of location ties between the World of Darkness and the Age of Sorrows. Why is it called the Age of Sorrows? It is called the Age of Sorrows because creation is under threat. And in the, the earlier edition, that was supposed to be a very real and present threat of the Yozis trying to escape Malfis and destroy creation. In third edition, they've said that that's not quite a thing, that the Yozis can't escape no matter what. And the reason they've said that is because if you have a demon primordials trying to escape, escape and destroy creation, nothing else going on matters. So they wanted to kind of walk back that threat and have all of the other threats that are facing creation. And so you have imminent invasion from the wild once again, the Raksha, these, these beings of chaos that live out in the wild that eat mortal souls and, and identity are massing for another invasion. You have the rise of the Abyssal Exalted and the Death Lords who are wading their way onto the stage of creation and have seized kingdoms in the mortal realm and 
started pulling them into the underworld. You have the return of the solar exalted, which is causing upheaval all across creation. You have the realm, kind of the central stabilizing force of creation at each other's throats since the empress has disappeared. Uh, you have the return of the alchemical exalted, as I mentioned before, coming to steal uh, resources of creation to save their own world. Kind of everything's going to hell in a handbasket all at once. Now, is it getting bad or is it just a lot of stuff is happening at once? A lot of stuff is happening at once. I have mentioned on my own show the idea of day zero metaplot, where you have a whole bunch of situations that are going to evolve and uh, Exalted gives you that. It gives you a lot of things in motion uh, and then says, move these things where you will. And I, I think that's a really cool way to do it. And, and there's just a, lo a lot of stuff, a lot of threats facing creation all at once. And I think it could go very badly. Uh, another reason it's called the Age of Sorrows is to contrast it with the first age or the Shogunate period, where in the first age, the exalted reigned over creation together, and, and there was kind of a, a magical golden age. And then during the Shogunate, the dragon blood had maintained as much of that as they could uh, on their own, uh, with the other exalts being out of the picture. And so in this, this modern era of exalted is kind of a fallen age to the more majestic past. Interesting. So this is another game where things used to be nice, and now they kind of suck. <laughs> Yeah, but they were never really nice. Um, okay. <laughs> they were just, it was more orderly, I guess you could say. Yeah. Uh, I mean, during the first age, uh, you had the solar exalted as kind of god kings. And the reason they were overthrown is because they, they uh, were succumbing to the great curse and falling to madness and, and fighting each other and redefining uh, laws of reality in places. And it became kind of a mess. And then during the Shogunate, the Dragon Blooded tried to maintain their creation spanning civilization, mainly by turning to slave labor. So uh, you, you still have, have those kinds of issues going on. But the, I wouldn't really say there was a, a past uh, age that was much better than the age is now, just one that was bad in different ways that uh, scholars would declare that they are in a fallen age in, in the modern setting of Exalted. Got it. That seems like one of those things where people are like, it's the world of darkness. I'm like, dark for who? If you just got a functional hip replacement, I'm going to say that was better than the world where that didn't exist. Um, <laughs> uh, so I guess we've gotten a very brief overview of creation. We've gotten a very brief overview of the exalts. Before we leave that, are there any bits of that world that you think are particularly interesting to mage fans or that you think storytellers could steal before we talk about mechanics? So uh, two things, and, and one is kind of a setting thing. While you said it's hard to explore creation from a mage perspective, and, and that's certainly true, there are bits and pieces that you can take. One of the oldest setting cities is Paragon, where the perfect of Paragon discovered an ancient artifact that let him define the borders of his city and mark all of his citizens with a sigil that okay. let him oversee their actions and, and enforce his will on them with law. And so he has this perfect kingdom where everybody follows the law or else they are driven from their houses screaming when the sun sets and, and then hunted as criminals. Oh, wow. I could super see like a small town somewhere that is ruled over by a something that has an analog to that or the seemingly perfect suburb where you have this demonic homeowners association that more or less does the same thing. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's definite fodder for World of Darkness or, or Mage or Chronicles of Darkness or, or something else, I think. And, then, and there's a lot of little things like that scattered across mm. creation. So uh, even if you don't expect to set games in creation, you can take bits and pieces and characters and, and uh, kind of story hook ideas and, and bring them into your game. But the other thing that this kind of ties in is artifacts, because the Exalted wield artifacts of power. And in third edition, these gives that give them even more extra powers, but each one is supposed to be a unique creation of magic. And these are, are typically like Final Fantasy JRPG style weapons and, and uh, fantastical suits of armor. So one of the examples 
is a sword called Gorgon that has an eye on the hilt that slowly opens as you wield it in battle. And when you kill people with the sword, they turn to stone. Uh, and with the eye open, like its very gaze can turn enemies to stone around you. I really, I like the art for that one. So that one jumps jumps to memory. But there's a, a bunch of weapons like that. I think there's, a, there's another one that is a storm demon bound into a sword. And so every time you sheath the sword, it, it releases a burst of lightning. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so uh, another one is a, a lava sword volcano cutter that summons up the blood of the earth as you as you battle with it. There's all kinds of stuff like that. There's a, another sword that that uh, falls in love with its wielder and becomes jealous of other weapons. So they're they're pretty cool. Oh, neat. So let's have a chat about mechanics. You have this very high energy world where you are you are the cream of the cream of the crop uh, beyond. What restrictions are there on your abilities? Is there a paradox mechanic or anything like that that holds it in place? And what kind of powers all this stuff? So Exalted uh, use Essence, which they, is the magical energy of creation that they you know, pull in and use kind of as easily as breathing for them. It is a natural part of how, how they act. And that fuels their their charms. And charms are kind of the mechanical pieces that give them their cool powers. If it's super easy to get, how is that a restriction? Do the, do the effects burn through it real fast? or They do. And in, in previous editions of Exalted, a lot of combat boiled down to how quickly can you get the other guy to use up all of his essence and then you can kill him? And can you do that more efficiently? Now, mm. in 5th in edition, they've walked that back a step, both by removing perfect attacks and perfect defenses and by saying that Exalted regained five motes of essence every turn. And so a, a typical starting character has in a range of 40 some odd motes of essence. And you can very easily burn through 10, 12, 17. Uh, I think I burned 22 in a single turn at one point recently. So you can, you can burn through them very fast. So that just getting five back every turn lets you keep using your cool powers, but you do still have to be cir circumspect about how quickly you can use them. So like I said, in combat, you get five back every turn. Outside of combat, you get five back every hour. And that's to keep the narrative powers and the combat powers on the same kind of price scale. And there are, there are rules, there's rules guidance about not gaming that system, which is nice. Okay, so that's one of those things where I have a charm that allows me to to cleave rocks in twain, and I will need that at a different rate than a charm that allows me to weave a tail uh, so enrapturous that people are uh, taken off guard and do not notice the thief moving through the crowd uh, as that story is being told, and like the the essence requirements are kind of scaled so that those two kind of work out. Yeah. Uh, okay. they, and they may have a similar price, but because you have the the faster recharge in combat, you don't need to worry about having different power scales for them. One of the other cool things about spending essence is that there's the idea of personal essence and peripheral essence. And the way I think about it is that pers personal ens essence is the magic energy within yourself uh, mm -hmm. as one of the exalted. And peripheral essence is kind of your gravity. Because you are a mystic being, you attract essence around you. And when you use peripheral essence, it begins, it, it ignites and burns in the air, giving you a glowing halo uh, that differs by exalt type. And so I've, I've always thought that's a very cool part of the image that you get these heroes and they're, you know, they're blazing cast marks appearing on their foreheads and a corona of energy around them kind of declaring their power. I mean, that just sounds badass. Is that a problem? Well, it's a problem only, well, in, in a couple of senses. If you are a solar or lunar exalted, and, and uh, like there's really most of the exalt types and trying to keep things on the down low so that okay. dragon blooded don't come to kill you, you're going to want to not display all that power. Uh, because like I said, the religion teaches that you are demons and, and need to be feared and hunted before you gain too much power. And then for the dragon blooded, because they are empowered by the elements, their aura is destructive to things around them. So if you're a, a fire aspect dragon blooded and, and are in, in the, the literal heat of combat, the air will ignite around you and you'll, you'll be in the center of your own personal firestorm. And that can be problematic if you're doing this whole thing, maybe in a wooden building or in a library or something like that. I imagine they frown around such activities. Or on a horse. Oh, <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, is this a is this a setting that has flame retardant horses? From the sounds of it, the answer is no. 
Uh, you can use your charms to protect your steed as one of the dragon blooded, uh, okay. but but uh, mortal horses are not flame retardant, and so like you don't get dragon blooded cavalry commanders in the same way. Dra- dragon blooded are a largely inf- infantry force. Are there horse salted like in animals? Exalt. No. no. <laughs> There was a remarkable amount of hesitancy in that, which suggests that there's some weird edge case, much no, like we have but, Throg. Uh, there are god-blooded horses, because Hipparchus is the god of horses, and when he mates with mortal steeds, uh, his children are divine horses. That's amazing. I hope, similarly, the divine horses tell legends of like the first horse age and the second horse age and the rising of the second horses <laughs> and the coming of the dragon-blooded horses and so on. I just hope that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> So this is this is a Wuxia setting. Normally, when I think of World of Darkness combat, it consists of people slowly punching the crap out of each other or being shot. To maintain that form, are there any changes to combat to make it more elegant, I guess? Or is it just like, Dragon Brawl! So the main uh, kind of mechanic that they use to make combat cinematic and exalted is dividing attacks uh, between withering and decisive attacks where the idea is in a movie fight you're not beating on each other until you you have caused enough minor injuries to kill the other person that's not fun that's not cinematic i mean sometimes it does happen in a movie and you're always like oh yeah and, <laughs> as it's and, one bloody person like heaving themselves upon a slightly bloodier person right and so when you think about awesome movie duels you think about like the sword fight in the princess bride or the lightsaber duel in the empire strikes back there's a lot of back and forth uh, where the combatants are doing interesting things and being awesome but not really hurting each other and so that's what withering attacks do they give you a mechanic for building up advantage and this is tied to the initiative system so you are attacking the other person's initiative to gain initiative of your own, which you can then use to risk for decisive attacks. And so with a decisive attack, that's when you are actually making an attack to do damage. And uh, if, if you have enough initiative, you can really end the fight right there. You do get a couple of interesting questions, like if you have enough initiative early on, do you want to risk a minor injury to your opponent and lose initiative early on in order to give them an injury so that they are at a disadvantage? Or are you going to just try to build up your initiative to have one final decisive strike? So you've got some options in in how to approach that. Okay, but this is a case where there are really two modes of combat, people poking each other and people being cleft in twain or decapitated. Yep. Nice. And does the combat rules kind of look like Old World of Darkness? Is it the same thing where you have dodge and soak and standard dice pools, or has that been modified too? So you are rolling against uh, static defense numbers that set the difficulty. So you're not rolling your defense, you're not rolling your soak, but you do have a static defense value, which can be either parry or evasion, and that is based on your your fighting skills uh, and your your attributes. And then your, your soak is based on your stamina and your armor, and that reduces the incoming initiative damage. But when decisive damage is on the table, uh, your soak doesn't matter. It's, it's really, uh, at that point, it's what, what does the advantage that they have look like in this, hmm. in this situation. So there's, there's some interesting caveats to all of it. But if someone is interested in, let's say, a more elegant looking, but maybe slightly crunchier combat system, this is something where they can grab Exalted 3rd Edition. And if they want to add withering and decisive combat, they just kind of can. Yeah, and and I actually find that the system runs faster if you're using mortal characters instead of exalted characters, uh, because a lot of the kind of slowdown of exalted combat crunch is the charms, is figuring out which charms do you want to use? How do they hook together? How do you get the best set of options out of your charms? Uh, but the system's actually pretty fun for just mortal combat as well, because you get this back and forth. And then one of the other aspects of Exalted is the idea of stunts, where if you describe your character awesome, you get a bonus in game. Is it literally a narrative thing where you say, instead of attacking, I will I will pull my sword sky sp- splitter out of its sheath, invoke the name of my last three grandfathers, and, and cry vengeance upon my foe? Or Yeah, that would be a, a good example of a stunt. 
what does doing a stunt do? Are there levels or types of stunts? Yes, there are levels of stunts. There's always been this idea of three levels of stunts. Uh, and so it gives you a mix of bonus dice and automatic successes. It also gives you recharges your resources. So if you if you do a level two or better stunt, you recover a point of willpower. If you do a level three stunt, you recover two points of willpower and you can go above your maximum willpower because level three stunts are supposed to be totally awesome and like everyone at the table is supposed to go, wow. I do find the leveling of stunts a little bit cumbersome um, because I find it hard to judge on the spot how good the description of, of my players is. I mean, sometimes a level three stunt is obvious, but if someone's describing a like the third stunt of a combat, it's kind of hard to judge, well, is this up to level two standards or is this a level one stunt? Mm -hmm. and, and so we have started shifting to not having leveled stunts um, at our table because it adds a, an, extra, an extra bit of, of kind of mental load. So... I really like adding something like a stunt mechanic to every game that I run uh, mm -hmm. because I love when players put the effort into giving an awesome description for how they're doing something. So whether that's D&D &D where I'll, I'll give someone advantage for a, an awesome description or World of Darkness or Chronicles of Darkness where I'll give them an extra die, I like introducing that kind of stunt mechanic. And it doesn't just have to be in combat situations. It's also a great way to reward good role-playing so if someone makes a, a, an impassioned speech as part of a social influence action, you can be like, that's really awesome. Have some extra dice for, for talking good. And that answers the question of why am I even saying anything? My character has nine dice in his charisma plus a streetwise role. I could never get anything close to this to, it, to convince this gang that they should team up with me. But a stunt mechanic says, ah, put your back into it. You'll probably get something out of it. Yeah. It sounds like this is a game where if everyone isn't just fight good people and you're kind of at the pinnacle of creation, there's probably a lot of like intrigue and and political maneuvering and machinations and so on. Are there systems for that, like convincing people to do things or convincing people not to do things and such? Yes, there's a, a kind of deep social influence system, which I really like, though it's, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to get people to remember how all of it works. So the, the basics of the system is that to convince someone to do something, you need to base that on something they care about. And yes, you can threaten or bribe somebody, that's a thing, but it's harder to do that than to learn about their passions and kind of push on those. And so Exalted has a system of intimacies, which are either statements of a feeling towards a person, place, or thing, and those are called ties, or statements of principle, and those are called principles. And if you learn about the NPCs and learn what their intimacies are, uh, you can use those intimacies kind of as a lever point to exert social influence. And uh, just like in combat, there is a kind of a static number, a, a character's resolve, that represents how hard they are to convince of something. And uh, working to an intimacy uh, is going to give them a penalty to their resolve, and working against an intimacy is going to, to give them a bonus to that resolve. And uh, you can have multiple intimacies coming into play at the same time if they've got conflicting motivations. You uh, Another aspect of the system is that if you successfully convince them of something, they can spend willpower to not do it, but only if they have another intimacy that they can cite that would help them push against that influence. So you've, you've got kind of a neat system of needing to learn about people in order to find out the things they care about so that you can uh, exert your social prowess against them and convince mm -hmm. them of things. And then that gives you a lot of, of neat places to hook charms where a social character in Exalted has as many powers as a combat character. Their powers are just about being able to instill temporary intimacies in their targets or find out what their, their target's innermost secrets are or be able to use their own intimacies to make compelling arguments to people. There's a lot of, a lot of different things that they do using the intimacy and influence system. And I like that because one of the one of the problems I have with Mage is the mind sphere for me has always been hard to use in that it's one of those things where you can nudge someone subconscious or you can take over their mind. But the idea of reading intentions to figure out what someone wants and then being able to use a mortal skill 
much better of just flat out convincing them, but already having the benefit of knowing what they really want at heart seems like a way that you could introduce it without using just the nudge or brainwash method. Is there a way to discover someone's intimacies or do players just kind of have to guess? Uh, there is. There's a, one of the social actions is called read intentions, uh, where you make a role using your perception and socialize against the target's guile, which is generally how good they are at, at hiding their intentions or feelings. And one of the things that you can do is use that to suss out an intimacy. And so this isn't like mind reading. You can't just say, I'm looking at that guard and I'm going to make a read intentions role. But if you engage a top, uh, someone in, in a conversation, say you are talking to Naman Sarissa about the realm, you may then say, I'm going to roll read intentions to see if Sarissa has a intimacy towards the realm and what is that intimacy. You can kind of get these things through conversation of the right topics. But it's not quite nerd super genius where it's like, I can tell based on how you're eating that cheese that you're worried that your husband is going to leave you. Uh, but you can do that with certain charms. Charms. Okay, got it. Because with a charm, you can stab someone with the fact that you were picked last in kickball. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> are there any other novel systems in Exalted? Since it's storyteller based, it seems like, or what I now refer to as the storytelling system, because I can never remember which one is which. Uh, are there any other novel systems that you feel could be stolen into a urban fantasy game like Mage? So one of the systems that was very different in Exalted 3rd Edition is crafting. And it's kind of a controversial uh, subsystem because, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> because there's, a, there's a little bit of rules bloat there. And it does something very particular that not everybody likes. So the basic of the crafting system is that you as a crafter make things and that gives you a resource called crafting experience if the things that you have crafted are relevant to the narrative. And then you can use those crafting experience points to make more awesome things. So in theory, this means that you're going to be uh, thinking about, well, what, what things can I make for other characters that are, that are going to affect their intimacies? Because that's one way that you can, can get crafting experience. Or what can I make that is going to, to be of significant advantage? And that's another way to get crafting experience points. Uh, and then you can use those points to make roles to create artifacts or do other types of, of major projects. And is this something where everyone can make it or is there like a maker skill set character type? So there is a craft skill and it's one of the couple of skills that isn't just a single dot track. You have to define what type of crafting your craft represents. So I run the Fall of Jara uh, actual play and one of the characters is a crafter and she has craft mechanical engineering and craft architecture. And so she can't go and sew a dress but she can design a building or build a bridge or build a catapult or something like that with her craft skills. So you, you do have a, you do kind of have a, a narrower focus with your crafting. Are there crafting charms? Like, is there an A-team montage charm where in a very short period of time with appropriate musical backing, you can turn a chariot into like the Trojan horse? Uh, yes. So every skill has, uh, for Solar Exalted and for Dragon Blooded, Every skill has a set of charms. And then even for Exalted, like the Lunars, where their charms are tied to attributes, they still address crafting with some of their charms. And so, uh, again, like combat or like social situations, you have a full set of charms for crafting. And this is actually one of the, the areas where it was controversial because the solar Exalted crafting charm tree was seen as rather bloated. Um, mm -hmm. in that there are a lot of charms and a lot of them do similar things to different degrees. Ah. Uh, and so there was an impression that it was a lot of experience invested into craft charms for not a lot of return, because once you got the higher level version, you would never turn back to the lower level version. Yeah. Um, I think the dragon blooded take on craft charms is a lot more streamlined, the very little of that kind of repeat um, inefficiency. So I think, and then the Lunar Exalted have a similar, slimmer, uh, more focused crafting charm set. So that's that's where you, you get with the crafting charms. So we have done kind of a crash course in Exalted, its mechanics, the denizens of creation and such. This, unlike most of the times when we cross over, when we talk about crossover, is a clearly different world. Do you ever see someone bringing an Exalted to the world of darkness? 
So there was a supplement suggested by the previous set of Exalted devs. They wanted to make a book called Exalted versus the World of Darkness, where part of the original conceit of Exalted, like you said, uh, was in those late uh, World of Darkness books. They had this idea of before the World of Darkness, there was the Age of Sorrows. And Exalted was the, the secret history of the World of Darkness. And so there were a lot of ties between the two. And just to bust in, one of those ties is so direct that in the revised LARP handbook, the deluxe edition literally has a letter from a sidereal that says, hey, I'm an avatar now. And that's really on the nose. But if you would like the full panoply of crossover, go to the White Wolf Wiki. It has a whole bunch of information about what lines up to what. So what is in this supplement? The original concept was that something happens and the kind of arc of souls of all the exalted gets released out into the modern world of darkness. And so you get mortals who are once again chosen by the gods because these these exalted souls have survived into the modern world of darkness. And uh, you could have a solar exalted facing off against a vampire on, on the roof of, of uh, some urban area, uh, for example. Anything with the word solar in its name, I feel like that's going to win over the vampire. <laughs> they, but... they do produce sunlight as a as a, <laughs> as a a cost of using their powers. So Interesting. But I, I really want to see a sidereal and a mage just look at each other and kind of be go, huh. And the other one just goes, huh. Or something like that. And then they uh, walk away from the conversation and nobody remembers it. Exactly, because they one has arcane fate and the other one just has flat out arcane. Uh, so if uh, if the audience has enjoyed this episode, are you willing to come back to talk about that? Maybe when your schedule has allowed you to thumb through it. Yes, I, I'd be very happy to come back and talk more about Exalted. So let's talk about some plot ideas that come out of Exalted. One of the first ones is to go through the Exalts themselves. I think Solar Exalted are a good standard if you're looking for a mortal possibly who's been endowed by the powers of a Celestine or an Incarna. You can have a metaplot event where the planets are waking up and choosing champions, and maybe the Sidereals have returned as well. Most of the systems mesh in reasonably well with some modification, and if you turn Essence into Quintessence, it kind of gets there. You may need to divide everything by two. They tend to chew through Essence at a far greater rate than mages would go through Quintessence. You could have an area where the living and the dead seem to be mixing, but the sleepers don't notice. The area could be ruled over by something like an abyssal, maybe that kind of looks like the Mask of Winters, who is an interesting antagonist. Google that one. Maybe a marauder committed shapeshifter can only take on the form by their paradigm of entities whose hearts they've consumed, and that includes people. So that could be uh, kind of grisly, but it shows commitment. There could be shadowy figures that are destroying magical items or removing wards or undoing works of magic in the same way that the sidereal loom of fate has its strings go into a flutter whenever essence is used. Maybe the same occurs with quintessence. And you have these high arcane characters moving around that are trying to restore balance that turn out to be something that very much looks like sidereals. Or maybe paradox spirits take on that form and kind of act like an adjustment bureau and go around and kind of fix large changes. A cosmological change could occur where maybe the gods originally lived in the high umbra and ruled over nature, but they got bored and tired of dealing with it, so they kind of started outsourcing work to the weaver and letting it take on more and more of the world, and the, the weaver called this physics. Maybe a rain god that was keeping a certain area fertile has given up and passed that area over to control of the weaver, and natural weather systems make that area maybe more desert-like, and the characters will need to find that god and convince it that it needs to return to its duties or its people are going to starve. The idea of liminals, characters that at the cusp of death kind of get to knit themselves together and mix and match parts to get powers are an interesting way to have something that's maybe a little bit more interesting than the traditional Risen that are presented in Wraith. In addition to that, if you're looking for an example of what mage power politics would look like, the dragon-blooded and the duels between families seem like a good place to look for that. One of my favorite options are the Raksha, these creatures that live at the edge of creation that consider fixed forms to be an attack on reality and possibility. 
manifest in the Deep Umbra and start attacking Horizon Realms. These entities are explained in the books Graceful Wicked Masks and The Fair Folk for first edition. Also, Victor Kinzer and Simon Eichhornchen from Walking Away from Arcadia did an episode on it that is absolutely fascinating. All of this is in the show notes. If any of the areas you heard sound particularly interesting, grab the Compass of Celestial Directions series. Uh, Yu Shan is the first, but the rest all outline some pretty fascinating places in creation. The volume six on Autochthonia is pretty fascinating, as is the Manual of Exalted Power for the Alchemicals. You may want to introduce City Fathers, that there are these city spirits like there are in Werewolf, but instead of blessing the Garu, they bless mortals who gain superhuman powers that kind of make them seem like scions. Thumb through the charms. It gives you some pretty fascinating ideas on what effects could be. Uh, One of my favorite is the phantom arrow technique, which lets you make an arrow out of an intimacy that does extra damage based on its strength. So you can literally shoot someone with how mad you are at them, or you could stab someone in the eye, powered by the fact that you hate the fact that you were picked last in dodgeball and you have a strong sense of justice regarding that. You could do this with Mind 3 and Matter 3. A storyteller may require Prime 2 in the mix. If the feeling were appropriate, it would probably do aggravated damage, at least at my table. Some of the magical items and weapons are pretty fascinating. The Infinite Chakram is this bladed hoop that is Baroque in style and will always bounce back to the thrower. In previous editions, this would probably be Forces 2, Entropy 2. Nowadays, it may be Forces 3, Entropy 3, as a rote, but it gives you some fascinating style and considerations. If you've done a crossover of some sort and you'd like to tell us about it, give us a holler. Made to the podcast at gmail.com. Hit us up on Twitter. Tell us in the Discord. We'd love to hear how it went. This has been an absolute crash course, and thank you so much for giving it. If our fans have enjoyed hearing what you have to say and would like to uh, learn more about Exalted or your other projects, what can they do? Well, the best thing to do would be to go check out the Story Told podcast. Uh, I co-host that with Logan. We covered a lot of Exalted, but other games besides in the World of Darkness, Chronicles of Darkness, and beyond. Most recently, we had Terry on to talk about Invisible Sun, by Monty Cook Games, which is a great deal of fun. And you can find the show at libsyn.com slash the story told. You can also find us on Facebook at the story told. And you can find me on Twitter as at story told Chaz. I have had the distinct pleasure of meeting Chaz in Meat Space, and it was just a hoot. If you ever hear me yelling loudly and there is a very polite person smiling next to me with uh, short hair, it is probably Chaz. So that is that is one way to identify Chaz in the wild. Uh, Chaz, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I'd be happy to come on again. If you've enjoyed what you heard here and you're not already a subscriber, please go to magethepodcast.com to subscribe. We're also on anchor.fm as well as Spotify and iTunes. If you'd like to follow the adventures of Mage online, also follow us at Mage the Podcast on Twitter. If you have any questions, feel free to send them to magethepodcast at gmail.com or come ask us in our Discord server. And with that, bye.